Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Catching Up on Kaka'ako. Today, we're going to talk about climate change and sea level rise in Kaka'ako Makai with Chip Fletcher of SOAS that you ate. Thank you, Jay. It's good to be back. So, you know, Think Tech has been covering Kaka'ako since Think Tech began. Um, we have had an enormous number of, of shows back in the aught years. We had all these people come around and talk to us about what was appropriate in Kaka'ako, how critically important it was uh, for planning and for mm, dealing with the environment and so forth. And I, um, some of those shows we still have. And there was so much discussion about leaving it as a park, and so much discussion about preserving it as a, a place of recreation and relief for people. Um, to get away from the, the madding city, so to speak. Um, and now we are here again, uh, where um, there's a bill in, uh, in the legislature that would permit uh, or reverse the, re the limitation on residential construction in Kaka'ako Makai. So much blood through our minds and memories about all of that. But I thought it'd be great to talk to you because you have studied you know, the, what do you want to call it, the topography, uh, the uh, uh, sea level rise implications along that whole shore around the whole Oahu, actually. Uh, and you can talk to us about how sea level rise and climate change will, in the next few years, affect, it, affect any kind of construction there or, um, you know, in similar uh, areas along the coast. So uh, can you talk about um, climate change? Sea level rise in Kaka'ako Makai. What is likely to happen there? What effect is likely? What what is going to be the effect of all of that on construction? Yeah, thank you. Um, so there are two primary things we should be worrying about. One is sea level rise. The other is heat. H e a t. Uh, and just to sort of touch on heat first. Uh, NOAA and the National Weather Service uh, and some other agencies are starting to tell us that we can expect an El Nino, uh, possibly, uh, this coming summer and over next year. The last uh, significant El Nino we saw in Hawaii uh, was in 2015, 2016, and we saw record-setting heat, heat waves. Um, I remember in uh, the summer of I think it was 2018 or 2019 when we did not have an El Nino, but we had a marine heat wave a body of warm water settling around Oahu. We broke 300 temperature records in Honolulu that summer. So um, if and when we see an El Nino, uh, we may expect some extremely hot summertime and fall uh, temperatures. And Kaka'ako Makai and Kaka'ako writ large, in fact, all of urban Honolulu, uh, has not yet implemented shade or heat mitigation uh, efforts uh, in community design. Uh, so that's one, one thing we need to worry about. Now, with regard to sea level rise, uh, of course, we get flooding and uh, we get multiple types of flooding. We may have uh, typical South Shore summertime high wave events splashing up over the seawalls, running uh, into the community, the first block, maybe the second block of the community, depending on where we're located. And as sea level goes up, this seasonal non-storm, not a, not a hurricane, the seasonal wave uh, is going to be flooding further and further landward. What does that seasonal course, mean? How uh, often is this season? Is that once a year or more? Yeah, seasonal is once a year. And then when it comes to waves on the south shore of Oahu, we're talking uh, summertime. That's when, that's when we see surf events. Folks grab their boards. They go to Waikiki. Uh, they go body surfing at Point Panic at, uh, yeah, at, off of Kaka'ako Makai, et cetera. Then, of course, we do have... Um, the rising incidence of hurricanes. Uh, science research has shown that tropical cyclones have been migrating away from the equator. And for Hawaii, that means that tropical cyclones or hurricanes that would 
previously passed south of the Big Island are, are now approaching uh, at the same latitude as the Hawaiian Islands. And so uh, we may see more hurricanes as a result of this. In fact, although the uh, the statistics don't bear it out yet because it's been such a short time period. But over the last five to eight years, uh, we've seen quite a few hurricanes come close or actually touch touch onto the islands. And hurricanes you're, you're, are, you're talking about more hurricanes, but what about the extreme quality of the hurricanes? That's what I was just going to mention, where hurricanes are intensifying more rapidly. Uh, you may recall... Um, hurricane, oh, I'm blanking on its name, but uh, the hurricane that was barreling down uh, towards Honolulu, it intensified from uh, a, a hurricane intensity one to a hurricane intensity four, literally overnight. And this is a new characteristic of hurricanes. Um, but then we have other types of flooding. We have uh, the storm drain system, the drainage system, uh, which is designed to use gravity to drain off rainfall, to drain off runoff, um, that storm drain system is getting backfilled by rising sea level. And several times a year, typically during our king tides, our storm drain system fails. And that's because it is filled with salt water. And should it rain at that time, um, that rain has nowhere to go. And we saw exactly this happen on December 5th and 6th in 2021 when a, uh, a Kona storm, a Kona low, hit the south shore of Oahu. Uh, it hit exactly when there was a king tide happening and we had standing water that was two to three feet deep in Waikiki and other areas on the south shore. So our storm drainage system really at high tide as a gravity designed engineering infrastructure is no longer effective. It doesn't work by gravity anymore. We need to start thinking about pumped drainage where the storm drain system um, removes uh, rainfall at high tide by pumping. So those are the main forms of flooding that'll take place. Storm drains, backflowing on the streets, uh, waves splashing up and running uh, over the shoreline. And then actually, um, let me also mention groundwater flooding. The water table is very close to the land surface under Kaka'ako and Waikiki. And at high tide, there are places where the water table already is nearly breaking through the ground surface. And what is that called? It's called a wetland. And so at high tide, we get a temporary wetland for an hour or so, and then the tide goes down again. So, um, I do have a map that shows some of these features. Uh, if you're interested, I could walk us through that. Oh, sure. But one, one other thing I want to ask you about it is that Kaka Akamakai is, um, you know, the product of um, a, uh, a refuse station for many, many decades. Uh, and it has, uh, you know, many tens of feet of uh, garbage uh, under the topsoil that was put there to create the park. Um, so there's not that much topsoil, but there's an awful lot of garbage. And the garbage, of course, is, uh, I don't know the right word for it, but from an engineering point of view, it's like porous. Water will, it's not the same as soil. Water will go through uh, compacted garbage or uncompacted garbage. And especially when you, when you realize that, that the garbage gives off methane and there are pipes there you know, to relieve the methane and so forth. So are any of these processes that you've been talking about exacerbated by the fact that this is not really land? Um, this is, um, you know, an old, an old transfer station. Well, I think the primary issue there is uh, the, um, the water quality will suffer wherever either the groundwater table or the overwashing waves come in contact with this refuse. So I don't know how this refuse is sort of wrapped or packaged, um, but I think that as we start getting towards four to six feet of sea level rise at the end of the century, we have to wonder how secure is this refuse? Even if it is wrapped, um, will it become buoyant? Will we see uh, it become unstable? Uh, no doubt already the water table 
is uh, in or around uh, this this pile of refuse. So um, exactly, you know, is, is the refuse leaching out uh, um, toxins and pollutants into the coastal water area already? Um, will it leach into the groundwater table malka of the park where the water table breaks through the land surface? These are all issues that need to be thought about. And I, and we already know that the water table is already heavily polluted here, right? We refer to, uh, to an aquifer under this area, but it's not drinking water, it's, it's brackish, uh, and it's got toxins and pollutants that have uh, filtered into the water table from all of the surrounding land uses. Uh, so we already know that the water table is, uh, is unclean. What what effect would construction of a of a high rise, say for example, a forty story uh, residential condo, a big one high rise, have uh, on the on the processes already underway? Well, I so I'm not a construction engineer, and I can't answer intelligently here. But I can I think it's not hard to imagine uh, deep piles going down to solid bedrock, there must be deep piles supporting uh, already our, our large uh, buildings. Um, and so I think there must be a mechanism where they don't need to use the refuse area or even any of the land area as their primary foundation uh, if they're driving in uh, deep piles or deep, uh, uh, deep footers, so to speak. Okay, why don't you show us your uh, your uh, inundation map? Okay, um, so Jay, this is a tool we have in my research team where we can simulate the flooding related to sea level rise to a limited extent. Uh, and what I have set up right here is two feet of sea level rise, which um, under some models may occur uh, by 2060 or 2070. Um, it, it may not be apparent to you that there's any flooding at all, but if I zoom in, um, these green blobs that you see are areas of flood water coming out of individual storm drains. And um, there are a few of them already in existence at two feet of sea level rise. Let's take a look now at three feet of sea level rise. These areas expand. And we see more of them. Almost every block uh, shows us flood water, salt water coming out of storm drains. And at four feet of sea level rise, this becomes very extensive. Now, this is basically the failure of the drainage system for many hours a day. And if we zoom out, you can also see in blue areas where there's direct marine flooding of ocean water. So green represents uh, water coming either from the groundwater table or out of the storm drains onto the streets. And blue represents direct seawater flooding over the shoreline. This does not represent wave flooding, which we know this whole parking area uh, on the shores of Honolulu Harbor, we know this area gets subjected to severe wave flooding. Um, our models indicate wave flooding over next to Koala Boat Basin. Uh, the park itself where the refuse is buried has higher elevation and isn't subject to as much wave flooding. So this is four feet of sea level rise, which is um, a good estimate of how high sea level will rise by the end of the century, provided that we don't see catastrophic rates of melting uh, in West Antarctica primarily. So the area you're talking about, the park, uh, is on that chart at the bottom bottom left of that uh, map. Uh, uh, we can see your cursor. Yeah. Uh, so I, I suppose it's right, right in that area right there. And, and the yes. park ends at that building with the white roof on it. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the walkway along the water that you can see that. Yes. They're running all the way. So this, the, the walkway along the water, the seaward edge of the park, um, these areas would be hit very hard 
by waves in the summertime when we have uh, swell coming up out of the southern hemisphere, and, and that is not shown here. So can we can we talk about what that means? In other words, uh, if I'm if I'm I don't know in the park, uh, if I'm walking along the walkway, if I'm um, you know there physically, or if I build something there, what what effect would that have on where I stand and where that structure stands? Would I be able to continue to stand there? Well, um, I don't think that walkway itself will be very usable in four feet of sea level rise. As far as a structure, uh, we can design any sort of structure that we envision. So a structure that is designed to live with water, one that uh, would allow waves to, to flow underneath it or, or through the first floor, uh, for the half a dozen times in the summertime when large swell events arrive, um, that's completely possible to design and build. I don't think that building in an area exposed to four feet of sea level rise is the problem. I think the problem is designing a larger community where you can still drive to that building, where you still have access to and from that building to the larger community, because no building represents you know, a community of its own. You need to go out shopping, you need to go to work, et cetera. So uh, you can see the large parts of the neighboring um, region are quite questionable. So we shouldn't just be thinking about a single building, we should be thinking about the whole region. It needs to entirely adapt to sea level rise. And, it can be done property by property, parcel by parcel, uh, but we need to consider buried infrastructure. We need to consider roads, open spaces, as well as the building stock. So when you say consider, I, I think you mean um, that we have to um, take steps with regard um, to all, all the structures, all the walkways, all the connections, all the parking, all the buildings, um, so that they, they, can, they can be reached. And that they can function as part of a what a community of buildings, and what it sounds like just listening to this discussion is that this is extraordinary steps. Um, that it will cost a ton of money to do any one of them, and to do a whole community of them will be fantastic in terms of the cost. No. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Which actually means the question that we're talking about is more than just the Kaka'ako Makai question. It is about all of Kaka'ako and Waikiki, and in fact, all of the Hawaiian shoreline. This must be done. And something I neglected to mention is that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports that have been coming out since 2021 make clear, in their terms, in their words, with high confidence that sea level is going to continue to rise for over a thousand years. This is not a temporary problem. This is a permanent new condition on the shoreline for all of our communities to take in, to assimilate, and to envision a new future. It's actually, if you want to you know, look at the glass half full, this is a real opportunity for us. And we still have time before the worst of this is going to hit. The worst of this will begin to become apparent um, by mid-century and thereafter. We're talking about exponential sea level rise. And so by mid-century, we start to see very rapid rates of sea level rise taking place. So we essentially have uh, 20 years to do the planning, to find the funding, uh, to implement the construction so that our communities can, can uh, continue to function uh, with higher sea levels, which are inevitable. You sit on the uh, city uh, planning, or rather the Climate Change Commission, right? And so, I used to, I used, used to. to. Uh, I stepped so, off uh, last summer. From the lens of, of that, you know, looking at it through that commission and the kinds of things they study and recommend and so forth, um, what can government do to make this, uh, this, this new, new community you're talking about to put it in, uh, in, in, in the right condition to prepare for uh, sea level rise. Um, I haven't seen it. Um, is there anything happening there? 
And, and, the, and part of my question is, you, can you do this on a, um, a societal basis? In other words, can you take steps to make the whole city of Honolulu better prepared? Or must you go building by building, path by path, lot by lot? Well, what the government can do is develop uh, procedures, policies, really permit requirements, so that whenever uh, an application for a project comes in, whenever renovation or repair comes in for a government uh, permit, that um, there are requirements among all the other requirements that are already in place, there are requirements to uh, prepare for sea level rise. And um, our Department of Planning and Permitting at the, at the city is well aware of this problem. Uh, it began with the previous mayor, Kirk Caldwell, issuing a mayoral declaration to plan for sea level rise. And the Climate Commission at that time uh, provided a guidance paper and there has been an update to that guidance paper as of uh, this past summer. So uh, guidance is in place from sort of the 30,000 foot level broad-based guidance. We also have the long range planning folks at DPP uh, who have looked at other cities and how they have uh, developed policies with regard to sea level rise and um, sort of considered how they might apply to uh, the primary urban core. And they've issued two reports, which are available online on the DPP website. So um, there's been strong movement, uh, but I don't know that we yet have permitting requirements in place for uh, independent uh, developers to come in. I do know, uh, lastly, that individual departments uh, at the city and county are required to look at sea level rise uh, in all of their activities and their uh, budgets and that the city department of, uh, or the city program for climate change, sustainability and resiliency is really working very well, uh, integrating all the different city departments and bringing them under a sort of a single umbrella onto the same plane of thinking in these areas. But it's not, it's not like building a city wall, uh, building you know, structures that would um, you know, save us from, from sea level rise. Uh, as, as a city project or a state project, it's a matter of setting up mm, permitting requirements. In other words, if I want to build something, I have to meet these permitting requirements, and it's on me. I, I have to find the money privately you know, as part of my project um, um, to, uh, to pay for these additional uh, you know, elements of infrastructure, and that changes that changes the community in the sense that any construction now has another test for feasibility because of the additional expense. Have you, have you yeah. talked about that, thought about that? Yeah, well, that's exactly what I'm describing. So there are permitting requirements for flooding already. Um, unfortunately, they don't take sea level rise into account quite yet. There are per permitting requirements for your plumbing, for your electrical, I mean, everything has requirements, this now will be a new set of criteria that you need to meet. And fundamentally, it comes in the design phase. Like, are you gonna go slab on grade on a low elevation parcel where floodwaters can come in and damage the first floor? No, we're gonna need to do post and pier or uh, a, a large podium. And, you know, these, for a large building, these, features can now become public gathering spaces. So we want to build shade in there. We also want to be able to catch the rainfall for our parcel so that we aren't overburdening a drainage system that, as we've been talking about, no longer is capable of drainage under higher sea level. There's lots of news under the sort of rubric of sustainability and resiliency. That's what all this means. What if we don't do that? What if, it, what if the, these uh, permitting requirements don't get adopted or don't get adopted in time or that they underestimate the threat, you know, and these natural processes you're talking about uh, have their way with us? What, what happens to our community? What happens to Kaka'ako Makai? 
I think we're looking at a community that becomes increasingly damaged by floodwaters, uh, a community that um, really is not a new, uh, renovated, vibrant community, a community that has been thoughtfully planned for the future. Instead, we'd be looking at a community that is uh, on its way down uh, into, uh, into uh, you know, an urban location where people don't want to go. Because? Because you would have um, roads that are riddled with potholes. Uh, you would have the smell of um, the uh, in-ground sewage lines um, coming up through the ground. Uh, all of the um, unconnected in-ground sewage disposal, septic tanks and cesspools, they all need to be replaced. Uh, you would have uh, sort of a growing mold from all the repeated flooding of uh, surfaces that weren't designed for it. Uh, you, you'd have the randomness of people trying to go to an area and encountering floodwaters and having to turn around to go somewhere else for a movie or a restaurant or recreation and deciding, well, it's not worth taking the chance to go there anymore. Um, that, that's just, you know, that's just. Uh, a, a very short list of what is probably hundreds of reasons why people wouldn't be investing, they wouldn't be renovating, they wouldn't be uh, redesigning. Really interesting. So you you spoke about the. Uh, uh, I hope I got this right. Four foot by mid century. No. What? What, what does it look by like? The, by the end of the century. By the end of the century. Yes. What's by mid century? One. One, One foot. foot. Okay, and it, it doesn't, it, I have this absurd image in my mind that um, on January 1st of 2050, all of a sudden, boom, the water goes up a foot. No, that's not what happened. Right. It goes up gradually. And, uh, you know, and, and, and by the, uh, 2049, it's, uh, it's a good part of that foot is already yep. inundated. So <clears throat> the question I, I put to you is, you know, how, how accurate is that? And what what kind of you know process do we have now? Um, like what's going to happen in five or ten or fifteen years? Uh, I guess it's going to be gradual. But as it is gradual, these things you're talking about happen. Yeah. So um, so yesterday and today we had a huge wave event take place on the North Shore. We had the Eddie I Cal Surf uh, take place. And all day I've been receiving photos from folks up on the North Shore showing uh, where waves have run under their homes, where they've run onto the, the one main highway that runs through the area. Uh, one person sent me a measurement of 350 feet, which is how far the wave ran down a road going Malka the whole way. Now, when was the last time that surf was this big? It was maybe a decade or two ago. Uh, this this you know, the, the eddy has been held more often, but we have particularly large surf happening yesterday and today. So that's sort of the 10 year, the decadal type of wave event. As sea level rises, exactly what we saw yesterday and today will occur every nine years, every eight years, every five, every year. So these extraordinary uh, extreme events are going to occur with greater and greater frequency if that serves as an example of what the future looked like. On the South Shore, we could talk about king tides. Now these king tides, people are used to them now. We know that we've been seeing them for, we've actually been seeing them for a couple of decades, but there's been great press co uh, coverage in recent years. Um, king tides are already uh, back flooding out of the storm drains coming up uh, through the ground and driving waves up over the beach and into the, into the back shore uh, development. Those are, instead of occurring twice a year, they're going to be occurring every month, then they're gonna be occurring every week and finally every day. Wow. And so uh... all, all that is by mid-century, under one foot of sea level rise, the rare king tide that we see today is gonna to be occurring every day. But how confident are you that it will not exceed one foot by mid-century? I mean, there are many factors working here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not confident that it won't exceed. Uh, 
uh, one foot by mid-century. Um, we do not understand the physics of the West Antarctic ice streams, and uh, they are they are the large uncertainty here. Uh, whether we see rapid acceleration of ice flow out of West Antarctica into the ocean, driving perhaps six feet of sea level rise by the end of the century, which is considered within the envelope of uh, of possibility. In fact, if if you're going to be designing or planning a major urban project, you really should be planning for six feet of sea level rise hmm. by the end of the century. And that and that would affect the, the specifications in the, Absolutely. In the permitting requirements. Very, very much. Yes, indeed. And it would make those uh, uh, fulfilling those requirements all the more expensive. Yeah. You know, it, it strikes me that we really, we as a community, we as a state haven't really bellied up to this. We, well, we don't perhaps, fully recognize it. Perhaps there's been more than you're aware of. For instance, uh, you know, will uh, elevated rail be extended from Chinatown to Alamoana Center? That's a question right now. But it has already been redesigned with six feet of sea level rise in mind. Uh, it's It's been redesigned so that the electronics at the rail stations are lifted above uh, a six foot high flood level. Um, should roads be raised six feet to accommodate sea level rise? Uh, they have raised portions of the rail so there's still a federally allowable height clearance for trucks traveling, uh, passing under the rail. Uh, Transit-oriented development around rail stations that where we're in an area subject or um, exposed to sea level rise has been redesigned with sea level rise in mind. There's actually been quite a bit done. You talk about uh, raising the level of, of roads and other infrastructure. Um, my goodness gracious, if you wanted to protect the, 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 the south shoreline of Oahu, you'd have a lot of roads to raise. This would be very expensive, and it would, it would have a huge impact on anything near the shoreline, including especially Waikiki, the engine of our economy. No? Right. So that's where. It's important to think about maybe not every single road uh, is going to be raised. Uh, maybe not every single parcel and every single building uh, can we afford to uh, adapt to sea level rise. These are extremely expensive problems. Are we going to raise these various features by filling the land uh, with, with fill? Or are we going to build a uh, sort of a mechanical and engineered device where sort of you have a low flyover bridge for a road? If we make a whole series of levees of raised roads, like uh, you know, like a series of rice paddies, in between them, the parcels are still going to flood from uh, from groundwater flooding, and there'll be no communication between them. There'll be no uh, flow of the water. These waters will become stagnant. They're already severely polluted as they rise up out of the ground. It's a huge problem. And, and really, we need our design community professionals, our professional uh, design consulting community in Hawaii. I believe the legislature should, should uh, fund several million dollars to bring our professional design community together to form a task force, a working group, and to come up with a new plan for Waikiki, Kaka'ako, uh, Evole and other low-lying critical parts of our of our uh, urban community, um, and put together a plan for us, and then we need to start moving on that plan. Yeah, it has to be coordinated in a comprehensive right. way. You know, you can't just say, "Well, this building has to comply with these specs, and that building has to comply." It has to be the whole area. So my question is, from what you've seen, what you know, and from what the requirements would be. And what the speed of the climate change and sea level rise would be, um, you know, what, how soon can we do this? And in the interim, what should we be doing? Should we be building more 40 story condos near the water? That doesn't seem, uh, that doesn't seem advisable. Well, um, so. This is a uh, this is a timing issue, 
you can't just raise a road because when it rains, you're gonna cause more flooding on the adjacent parcels as the road sheds the water. This is a relationship issue. The public uh, agencies and the private landowners and the developers and the, the hotel community, they, they need to build a relationship so that things are done together. Uh, this is a uh, public um, comment issue because, uh, you know, let's say a plan suggests that a set of parcels over there really don't fit in the general scheme. Uh, let's say that an area where we currently have a lot of uh, automobile traffic is proposed to become a walkable venue. Um, all of this needs to be vetted and that process we know is a, is a long uh, multi-opinionated process. Lots of people like to weigh in on their communities and they have the right to. Uh, so getting this plan together, I would say that we are um, so far uh, sort of behind schedule. Uh, we mm -hmm. need to move quickly on this because the process of planning itself, before we even break ground on some of this stuff, that could easily be five years or more. Yeah, and and unless we forget that people people speak out of self interest, right. uh, they speak because they are property owners or will be property owners, and they have a um, and so there's politics involved. But let me ask this: say it's five years, say it's ten years before we can you know get a system going here, uh, which which works. I mean, we don't you know it's not like we know for sure that any of these systems will work. Uh, they they may have to be tested and tuned before we know. And while we're testing and tuning, we may have surprises from Mother Nature uh, but that makes us change our minds about this. So in the five or 10 years or whatever it is, what do we do, Chip? What do we do about developing near the water? Well, I think one of the first things that needs to happen is DPP needs to act on the knowledge it already has and start putting in place some obvious low-hanging fruit requirements with regard to flooding related to sea level rise. Um, you know, we, there's no doubt that this is going to happen. Uh, science is fully on the side of, of uh, one foot of sea level rise by mid-century and you know, three to, to potentially six feet by the end of the century. There are some obvious things that we can do to prepare for this already. The drainage infrastructure, picking a few primary roads. And then I think the legislature needs to uh, consider the possibility of uh, major investment in the local design community. There, perhaps there are some planning tools where a situation like this has been encountered before, where an entire community uh, is in an urgent, almost a crisis situation, and some sort of overlay authority is created where planning can go forward, yes, with community input, but not with the endless back and forth and nimbyism and, and you know, personal interests driving, my opinion only, uh, stalling progress. I, I don't, you know, I don't know, but something along those lines. Well, would, would I be right to say that this, this even the interim steps here, the primary steps, the step, the first step, are going to take a little while to organize, to, to make it real, to fund it, to mm, get by, uh, you know, various um, various objections of one kind or another. Um, in that period, you know, from a scientific point of view, from a um, uh, you know a development of the city point of view, shouldn't we hold up? Shouldn't we hold up? What do you mean? Well, if if DPP doesn't know exactly what its rules are going to be, if the state doesn't have an organization built, if it hasn't funded a comprehensive planning process, should we just you know keep on going? Um, should we just build as if none of this was a problem? Um, just you know do what we were doing before, or should we wait? I don't think well. I don't know. You're trying to pin me down on something that I'm very hesitant to take one side or the other. I'm going to reject your black and white suggestion that uh, we wait or we don't wait. Um, and I think that uh, the reality is is more gray than that. I think responsible developers, I think most of our development community is very responsible. I think they're already aware of sea level rise. I know they are. Um, I don't think that anybody wants to build a 
a white elephant that, you know, in 20 to 40 years turns out to be uh, impractical. But I don't think that we can rely wholly on that as a coherent design for moving forward. Um, I urge uh, all of the agencies responsible for permitting and, and design of our urban community, and in fact, our entire shoreline community, uh, to, to move quickly, uh, to realize that time is wasting and that um, there's no more information we're waiting for. Science has already all of the data points and future milestones in terms of how high and, and at what time sea level will reach. There's already plenty of basis for planning what a new community will look like. Okay. Um, I, I think you wanted to show us your chart one more time, did you? Uh, I'm happy to. So this is four feet. Here is five. You can see that areas that were dominated by green, which is flooding not related to direct overland saltwater flow. Uh, now the area becomes subject to direct ocean flow. And six feet certainly is within the realm of possibility before the end of the century. Uh, and we're looking at a very problematic urban core. I, I greatly appreciate you coming on and engaging with me on this. And I look forward to our next discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jay. I do as well. Thanks for the discussion. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.